Hi, I'm Lanika. I'm Fernanda's wife. I met him about 17 years ago in Auburn University. We were both there as architecture students. I was in my third year, and he was there as part of an outreach program from Merida. He came back and finished his studies. He opened an office, got his master's in construction, and then about 10 years ago, what we know now is Centro Architects started taking off, and he's excited to bring to you tonight some things for his clients. So let's introduce Fernando Abreu. Hi everybody, thanks for uh, joining us in this video. Um, thank you Monica for the introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, give a big thanks to uh, Merida English Library for having us in their uh, series of uh, talks that they do at the library. Uh, we are honored to be uh, doing this. We're doing this video for all the people that unfortunately couldn't be there uh, because um, the COVID, because we don't want those gatherings to be big. So we really hope that this video helps you in your house and, and, and to find something that is helpful for you. Um, we're going to talk about the main issues that we have seen in our eight years of experience working in Centro. We work and we specialize in houses in Centro. We actually don't work in, in, in most of our projects are just uh, there. So um, the problems keep repeating and we have new clients and we keep getting the same issues. So we're going to talk about those specific ones and try to give you a, a way to solve the problems and in some cases to give you um, information that might be helpful for your house. In Centro Architects, we have been working, as I said, in Centro and we have three teams. We have a team of maintenance, which are these guys right here. Everybody's very young, younger than me. And we have uh, design, which are in charge of making the plans, making the designs to make sure things go according uh, to the plans. And then we have the projects team, which is the team that takes care of kitchen renovations, full projects, and things like that. So we have a full range of things uh, that we do at the office, and this is some of the stuff that we do. One of the main things that we do at Centro Architects is maintenance. We have different, we solve different issues in Centro. We do uh, from hydraulics, uh, iron, we do uh, irrigation, masonry, also uh, plumbing, waterproofing, uh, air conditioning, uh, we have aluminum, appliances, carpentry, uh, electrical, some cleaning, polishing, gas, uh, granite installation, and uh, pool equipment, pool cleaning, all of this is part of the things that we do at Centro um, as maintenance and, and, and this is some of the issues that we're going to talk about. Also at Centro Architects we have the projects. We do small projects like kitchen renovations, bathroom renovations, uh, people want to do some bedrooms and things in their house. We do all that. We also do full projects. We try to keep it to one project a year. The idea is to take care of the details and don't overwhelm ourselves with many projects that we can take care of. And so we try to get one project a year and devote all of our knowledge and all of our attention to it. Well, I would like to start this presentation talking about uh, one of the main issues in Centro, uh, which is the electrical. Uh, in Centro, we have uh, many people coming in and many houses that are using more electricity than we used to use here. So we have more air conditioners, uh, we have pumps running for or uh, water for pools and all of these electrical is being uh, increased in the last years so it's getting the transformers that or all the lines that are in Centro already passing their capacity so they there is very difficult to get a good electricity in Centro you want to be here with a lot of um, appliances and things that might not work as uh, as you as you like 
So um, let me tell you about some of the issues that are the most common here. Most of the people call me when they have a power outage in their house. Uh, sometimes you get a partial uh, electrical. So sometimes you have electricity in half of your house and the other half doesn't have it. This is because uh, there is um, different things that might have happening. Uh, one of them is the connections on the post or on your house. The, the post, from the post you get a cables, three cables that come into your house. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, and sometimes even four. When you have the two cables coming into your house, one of them might be uh, misconnected or with the time, with the wind and uh, with some of the hurricanes we have here, they get disconnected and they don't plug well. And at some point they start failing. And the only way to, to deal with that is calling CFE. They have to come and reconnect. They reconnect the, 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 uh, the cables and it makes it work back again. The other issue that you can have if you're having that type of problem is this type of base. Uh, this base is a normal base, is that what most of the houses have, but they have uh, plastic connections here that melt when the electrical is too heavy. So we recommend to use the 7200 base, which is a bigger base, which is normally used for commercial purposes, but um, it's better to use this type because when you have a lot of electrical consumption. So if you have a lot of air conditioners, think about changing to these to make it more stable. Uh, another thing that most people don't know is that this type, the new type of meter, comes with a protection. So if you have too much electricity going in or too low, it will protect itself. And how do you know it's protected itself? Uh, it starts clicking, it starts making like a clicking noise, and a red light comes on right there. So when you have a power outage, the first thing you have to do is go to your neighbors, both neighbors because you can be in the limit. So go to the neighbor on the side, on the left and on the right and check if they have electricity. If their meter is off or if they have that red light on, that means that they don't have electricity. So you're not the only one. So it's a bigger problem. If you see that you're the only one with the problem, then it could be one of the things that I told you before. Um, also, we have to consider that the transformers are um, under full capacity. Some of them can be increased the capacity and get more people, but normally here in Centro is not the case. Um, the other thing that uh, people call me about is when they're going to install their solar panels, they don't have a grounding in their house. It is very important to have grounding if you're going to have, especially if you're going to have solar panels, but in general it's good to have the, the grounding. Many construction builders here don't use the grounding and that's uh, something that is a common problem in the houses and you have a lot of problems because of that, especially because now we're using a lot of electronics. So the best grounding is to put these copper pipes into a well where you have water, where the electricity can disperse really quickly and um, if you uh, have a surge protector for example to help with the spikes of electrical we have variants in the electricity in Merida so you really need something that controls that and then uh, I want to talk about the dimmers for example this is something that many people don't know uh, it's a little bit disconnected from grounding, but sometimes you, you see in your house the lights are flickering and you don't know why. Sometimes we put lights that are not dimmable and so you have the dimmer, you think it's the dimmer, sometimes it could be the dimmer, but uh, most of the time if you see that more than one light is failing, it's the dimmer. If you see one light failing, it could be that the light is not dimmable. You have to change for dimmable light and that way the dimmer can work work. Another common problem people call me for is when their fans start going slow. One of the things that could be happening is the capacitor. The capacitor uh, is this thing that is here and it's a small thing that you replace on your, on your uh, fan and it gives it the strength back to start uh, going fast again. So you don't have to replace your fan. Try this first and, and you can go with it. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about plumbing. 
Uh, plumbing is that thing, the, the plumbing always, or the water always fails on the weekends. I don't know why I get phone calls in the weekend. I don't have water. <laughs> And this is like very common. So one of the uh, main issues that we have here in Merida is our water is not very strong. It doesn't get all the way to our uh, tanks on the roof. So we need to use sometimes illegally uh, pumps that will pump it up from the city to the, to the tank on the roof. What's the best solution? To have a cistern. Are you new in Merida? Are you building a new house? a cistern. It's very important because the cistern doesn't need that. The cistern brings water from the street, same level. It doesn't need any force. It's always going to have water and then from there you pump it into your uh, uh, upper tank or into your uh, system of pressure tank. Um, the pump, uh, many people call me because they have a problem with the pump. It start burning and the reason is there is not always uh, water on the street so the pump doesn't know when there is water on the street the pump knows when when we, when you install these pumps normally you have an electrical float so when the water is low the electrical float tell the pump to bring water in but in the street they might not be water so you might start pulling air and that burns the pump so uh, there is no solution for that so put a cistern will be the solution and this is the the, the problems that I normally get phone calls for. And then we have the cistern and the tinaco. Many people don't know that they have to clean their tinacos, they have to clean their um, cistern. And sometimes they say, well, I have a water softener. Yes, but the water softener normally goes after the cistern and after the water tank. So you're not protected from being, uh, for cleaning uh, this, you have to clean it uh, regularly, at least once a year, uh, to take all the uh, limestone that gets built on it. Um, it's important to put a float when you have a cistern and you have a pump that pumps water into a water tank. The pump can run when the cistern is empty. This is a possibility. Your cistern might be empty. You turn it on. I mean, it turns on because the there is water that is needed on the tank or is needed in the house and you start running the pump dry and that will burn it. So it's important to have a float that works the reverse as the one that I mentioned before. This float will, when it's empty, will turn off the pump. So when your cistern is empty like this, um, the pump will go off and it will not work unless you have water. So it will only work if your water, your, your cistern is full. So this is a protection for the pump that pumps water into the tank. Uh, we have also emergency tinacos or emergency water tanks that help us putting water when you lose power, especially uh, people that have the pressure systems. Uh, if you have a pressure system, the, there is a chance that you lose power. And if you lose power, the pump won't run and you won't have water in your house. So that's why some people put uh, emergency water tank on the roof and it works only when you don't have power. There is a, a mechanism, like it's called a check valve, that when the pressure is up, uh, is, is um, putting water or pressure into a uh, cover, let's call it like that, and then when the pressure goes, like it's released, this thing open and the gravity puts water into your house like a normal tank like most of the people have in Merida. But when you have a, a, a system that it's um, a pressure tank, you probably need to think about having an emergency um, tinaco. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about the pumps. Uh, the best pump always for a cistern is the submersible pump. The submersible pump has a lot of benefits. One of them is that it's working in the water, so it doesn't need a lot of string to pull the water up. And it is very likely that it doesn't fail much, if it's a good brand. Um, and then uh, you can put it 
in your cistern and when you're doing a cistern you want to make sure that it's big enough to uh, have uh, the full length of these ones because they're pretty high and you need to have enough space for it. Sometimes I've seen houses where they have a small cistern and then you're not able to put uh, this type of pump and they need to work vertically. You can't have them horizontally or in an angle. You have to have them vertical. I've seen many houses where they put them in, on, on an angle and that's wrong. It doesn't uh, work uh, well like that and it will fail um, at some point. Okay, continuing with the plumbing issues, uh, I get a lot of phone calls sometimes about the pressure pump. The pressure pump should work in a way that uh, when you open a faucet, you use some of the pressure of the tank and water start going out and after a while the pump kicks in. If you have a pump that is kicking in every time you open a faucet, that's not normal. And the reason for that, uh, unless if you have a pump that is running for, let's say it runs and then 15 minutes happen or 30 minutes happen and then start running again and you have nothing on, that could be a leak. But the main issue that people have is that um, the pumps start running every time they open a faucet. So there is no timing between the pump running as it should be. This is the way a pressure tank, look, tank, tank looks. And you have air on this top part and water. This is like a section, a cut. So you have water here, air here. The water goes in with the pump. The pump puts water in the tank, make this grow and make the, pre the air here uh, compress and that air try to get back and pushes the water into the house when it gets the full amount of compressing um, it comes back again the pump turns on and boom it fills it up and compress the air again and that's the way it goes so if you have a problem that your pump is like repeatedly going on and on and on and on sometimes what might have happened is that the membrane got broken and the whole thing gets full of water and when you touch the tank the tank you can move it a little bit and you will see that the tank feels heavy if it does look super heavy it's because it's full of water and that shouldn't be the other thing the other way you can check it is on the valve of air that it's on the top you can with a key press it a little bit and air should come out if water comes out of there then it means that this is broken and it has fill up everything with, with water. So that's one of the main things that fell with the pressure, the pressure tank. And one of the other things is um, sometimes it start working uh, in not the right way. And this is because these have to be checked at least every year. Um, the pressure in the tank has to be checked. To do that, you have to empty the tank. Uh, and pr check the pressure in it. Normally, the pressure in these tanks go from 20 PCI to 40. There is some that go from 30 to 50. And the pressure in the, in the tank without the water should be two less than the starting one. So if you have 20, it will be 18. If you have 30, it will be 28. So that's the, the way you check it. And it should be checked um, at least once a year and that way you make sure you have the right pressure and you have a system that is working properly. Um, the other thing um, is the water softener. The water softener, the main issue in the water softener is always the timing. Um, people say um, that uh, when, when they have the, the water softener working, they start feeling salty water on the system. Um, and this could happen like any time during the day and if that happens it means that your clock in the water softener has moved. How does this happen? When you have a power outage. So if the power goes off, most of the tanks have a, a, a mechanical uh, controller that loses the time or 
if it went out a certain hour, it comes back, you lose all of those hours and start working at off hours. It should work your water softener, in case you don't know, uh, around three in the morning is set up to work and make a backwash. The backwash uses the salty water from this tank. You should have salt in this tank. Normally it takes like uh, around four bags of salt every month. Um, if you are not using salt, if you start getting less than that use or, or you start noticing that it's not using salt, something is wrong with the water softener. But the water that is here helps the resin that is inside this tank um, be good again to soft your water. So your water passes through, gets soft and go out. And then after three days, more or less, that's what we normally put in these uh, tanks, uh, it start uh, not doing the softening. So you have to do a backwash. So you have to wash this resin to make it uh, have the, the water soft again. Uh, and that clock that you have here, if it's not electronic, because the electronic have battery, the backup, it's because it, the electricity went out and you lose power and the clock get moved. So if it's not working at three in the morning and you hear it going at uh, different hours, it might be just a matter of restarting the, the clock on, on the water softener. Um, another thing that many people don't know is that the water softener helps your pipes don't get um, the, uh, the calcium, but if there is calcium coming from the street or coming from your cistern or from your uh, tank or debris, that debris can pass through this resin and go into your house. So it's not preventing, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's not preventable. Like, so many people think, oh no, I have water softener, why do I have saro in my lines? Well, maybe the saro came from your tinaco or came from the cistern or from the street. So that's one of the things you have to realize So that. And then we just have the, the UV lights. This is something easy. The, the UV lights normally come with a, a number of days. So it's normally a year, 265 days. It tells you there 365, 264, and until you have um, uh, zero days. And that's when you have to replace it. Uh, another thing is the water, the reverse osmosis. Um, the reverse osmosis normally have uh, three filters at the bottom that have to be replaced every six months and then you have a membrane on the top that should be replaced every year. And uh, many people have issues with this little tank. This little tank work just uh, the same as the pressure tank. So when you replace this, um, this tank gets empty. And sometimes after you replace them, people say, well, why don't I don't have water? It needs to refill and it takes a while for this to refill. And then when it refills, you start getting your water to the right pressure. So when you do a, uh, the changing of these uh, filters, don't get desperate. You will get the right pressure with a little bit of time. Um, also, uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, uh, on, at the end of these plumbing issues about leaks. One of the first things when somebody call me and have a leak in their house, the first thing we check is the toilets. It's almost a, a very, very common that you get to a house and it's like you're checking for leaks in all the uh, places and the best place to look first is the toilet. So this is the interior of a toilet. And normally what happens is these uh, covers work in a way that when you pull this, it goes up, put this up, and then with the sarro, start building around this, and then it doesn't close properly. When it doesn't close properly, water start leaking into there, or um, it might have uh, another issue that the water goes above the drainage uh, pipe, 
So if the water goes above this drainage pipe, uh, the water will start leaking down. And if you have a pressure system, you have no idea how much water you're leaking through the toilets. So it is good to actually go ahead and every so often have a look into the interior of the toilet and make sure that it's not draining. This, because the Hapai uh, bills come every two months. So you won't be able to tell uh, that you have a leak after two months. So the first thing that you have to check is the, the toilet. If you can't find anything, the toilets are fine, the next thing to do is call Hapai. They have a, a, a special equipment. They come to your house, they find a leak, and they tell you almost exactly what it is. So don't waste time trying to break walls or doing things before you call the Hapai. Um, and then the last thing is the hardware. As I said before, you get some Saro built in here, you get some Saro built in here, and if you don't clean it regularly, you will start have uh, these type of problems of leaks. And uh, if you need to, these things also get rusted, get bad. You make sure you have to make sure uh, they are in good conditions. If not, you can always replace them. Well, um, now I like to talk about the water heaters. I can have a whole presentation about water heaters. Water heaters are always uh, a big issue. One of the main things that you have to know about the water heaters is uh, you have to give it maintenance at least every three months or uh, every month, if you can, every two months. You should go and find the valve that it's on the site and you can connect this come normally with a connection, uh, you're able to connect a hose in it and when you connect the hose you just open it, take the hose to a drain and let it drain for at least 10 minutes, 5 minutes to get all the small pieces of um, of sarro that get stuck to the inside they're forming and if you do this regularly you get them off you flush them out and that way you don't have problems later with the with the sarro the problem with the limestone here is that it sticks to the heating um, to the heating uh, pipes inside there is some uh, rest uh, the piping that gets really hot, the limestone ten tends to get stick to it, and then it builds up, builds up until the heating is not good anymore. So if you do this regularly, you can stop that from happening. Another thing that many people don't know, and I have this issue many times, I call the company of the water heater and tell them, hey, your water heater broke. What happened is, these tanks get a lot of pressure when the water is hot it breaks the tank so if you have a pressure system it's even more likely you need this thing that is here which is a relief valve and what the relief valve does is when the water heater gets to a certain pressure it opens it and it let water out it lets hot water out of the tank and it makes it uh, relief that and so the tank doesn't blow or doesn't break. This is very important. Many people don't know it. Many people don't have it and when you call the warranty that's the first thing they check. They said oh you don't have a relief valve so the warranty is not good and the tanks don't even come with that valve. You have to buy it separately so it's a good trick and you better make sure you have that to make your tank last longer and if you want to apply a warranty you really want to have that. There is other types of water heaters, which is the, um, the solar water heater. The solar water heaters are, um, in my opinion, I have a client that have it, and you have to have the, uh, the maintenance with the company. So the company that sold you the solar water heater should do a maintenance on it. The maintenance is almost uh, once a year and that way you guarantee that they're gonna give you warranty and they do give you good warranty. Um, they do replace the tank if necessary. One of the things that happen with these tanks normally the same thing that happened to the normal water heater. They, the tank gets um, so much pressure with the hot water that it breaks and 
they um, and they have to replace this piece and that's very very expensive so what you want to do there is make sure uh, the relief valve is there and to give it the right maintenance and what they do in the maintenance is they clean it and they make sure the two actually this because of the way they work they have two relief valves so you have to check that the two relief valves are working and that's what they do every time they give maintenance to it um, that's very important and then if, you, if you're gonna have a solar system you also have to have a backup system which could be a, a normal water heater electrical or gas but uh, this works when it's sunny but when it's not you need you need a backup and then uh, I want to talk about the taps filters shower heads cleaning I, I get these phone calls when people tell me, hey, I have a tap that the water is not coming out right. And I come and the first thing I check is the filter on the tap. So you, you now, when your faucets come, they have a tool that you can take out that filter. You can put it in vinegar and the saddle will go away. And that way the water will come back to normal. There is, it's very often, I get these phone calls all the time where people is like, oh, my shower is failing, my, my uh, tap is failing. And it normally is this. So if you keep it clean once a month, once every two months, take it out, put it in vinegar for a night, next day you can put them back up and you will see the difference of the water coming out. Now we're gonna talk about septic systems. So the main thing on the septic is um, many people don't know where the tank is. And this is because when they bought the house, sometimes it got renovated and they get connected to the same piping and they just didn't know where it went. Uh, the other thing is you buy a house and you normally don't ask where the septic is. So I advise, advise you, if you're gonna buy a house, the first thing you have to ask, where is the septic? Um, this is very important because the only way to know that a septic is failing is when things start overflowing from your toilets and from your shower uh, drains. So you don't want that to happen. You have to ask where the septic is and, um, and be able to open it and clean it. So when, when you want to know where a septic is, one of the only ways that we have found is we normally take out a toilet closer to where we think it is. So we think it's in the back or we think it's in the front. We take out the toilet that is closest and you can see the pipe going to a certain direction and we measure how much it is. We then measure on top of the floor and we find that other spot that could be a concrete box. We open it and then we go from there doing the same thing until we find it. It is a very difficult thing. You have to break floors, you, it's a mess. Uh, so you don't want to get there. So if you're going to buy a house, ask where, where it is. When they, what they do when they normally um, uh, clean it, they open the, the, the cap here and this is how it flows. It comes with the solids here and the water. The water overflows this way and the solids kind of stay in this area. Then the water again overflows, comes down here, gets filtered through stones and rocks and um, maybe some gravel, gets out here and gets into a well. So all of this process, when they come and clean, they take out these solids and they clean the stones and, and the gravel and get it back to work and water start filling up. So it's always fill up with water, but the solid is what you want to avoid, you know? So the, the, the water kind of stays on the same line. And after you clean it, you can have um, this running again. Normally the cleaning happens every five years. It could be 10 years. Some people haven't even opened them since they bought the house. The other system that we have, um, in here is the biodigester. Many people like this because it's, well, it's more secure because the other one is made out of concrete. This is made out of plastic. It's a little bit more resistant and it has less leaks into the, into the uh, dirt. But the only problem with this system is if you read on the instructions of the main page of this uh, specific one, you have to clean it every year or every two years at least. And that's something that is a little bit difficult. One of the problems that we found when we opened this to clean it is that if people drop um, toilet paper in here, 
uh, this pipe that runs in, in the middle goes all the way down and it's very close to this part here so the paper starts getting stuck in here gets hard if it doesn't have much water and it, it makes like a clog that doesn't let water pass through and that start making a problem it start backing up the system and having all kind of issues um, it is more likely to have a problem with these biodigesters that it is to have a problem with septic my eyes say one is better than the other i don't know i don't want to get into that discussion but in my experience this gives us way more trouble than the other type if you don't clean it regularly. Okay, now we're gonna talk about pools. Um, <clears throat> the main thing in the pool, um, you have the system, in the system you have the pool pump uh, and the filter. Those are the main things. And in, when you talk about the, the, the pool pump, one of the things that uh, happen often is that people don't check this um, thing here, which is in the front, this is a trap for leaves and, and uh, hair. So it has a basket inside that you have to take out and clean. And I have been in houses where they're supposed to do the maintenance every week and people come clean the pool and they forget to do this uh, thing here. And if you forget, you start getting uh, less pressure going through here because this is full of leaves and full of debris. <clears throat> so the water start uh, getting slower and then you have problems. You can have problems with the pump. The other thing that many people don't know or have issues with is the filter. The filtration in, in, a, in a pool, the water technically has to pass like four times over the filter. I don't. I'm not sure about the exact amount, but a lot of water passes through it. And it has a, a way where the water is coming through the pipe, comes in, passes through the filter, and then goes out. And one of the issues is with the time, the sand start going down and start compressing. So if it compressed, you don't have enough space in between the sand to filter really the pool. So what you have to do is do the backwash. And many people don't know this. Many of the people that clean pools have no idea about the backwash, what it is for, and the rains. And the, the thing you have to do is every, um, let's say 15 days, every month, you have to uh, move the valve that is on top, the, the, yeah, the valve, uh, move it to backwash. And what it does is basically, instead of keep doing this, it goes backwards. So it gets water from here and brings it up. And that moves the sand the other direction. So instead of compressing always the sand, it moves it. And that makes it um, get better again and has all this space in between. Rather than keep compressing, compressing, compressing into, into it becomes a rock and it's um, too hard to really do something. And the other thing that you have to consider when you're doing a pool uh, is the wells. You need a well for dumping that normally is 12 meters and a well for extracting water that is normally 18 meters. How can you measure this? You put a line with something heavy on the bottom, you let it go down right after they make the well. They make it with this type of machines. And you can measure then the string and see if it really has this amount of, of um, meters because that will guarantee that the water um, either gets dumped or you get good water, good quality water for your pool. Another thing you have to consider when you're doing a pool, um, and many people call about these issues, what finish should I put in a pool? Uh, when you have a painted pool, uh, it's very common that the painting has to be redone every so often, every two years, every three years. Some people have um, good, let's say, good ground around it or it gets built correctly and you don't have that much moisture coming from the ground into the pool. But that's the main issue with you paint. When you paint, some of the humidity comes out of the wall and so it comes behind this paint and it, it makes a bubble. There's a lot of different reasons why the paint will bubble, 
But here in the Yucatan, one of the ones that I have seen the most is the same that happened to our mamposteria walls in an old building house. The paint comes off. The same thing happened to the paint inside a pool. You get all this humidity coming from the back and make a blister or getting bubbles. So many people go with the chukum and I just want to mention that the chukum, it's, it doesn't have any crazy properties like people believe. The chukum is just cement uh, that has the chukum, which is a bark from a tree. They put it in water, cook it, and that gives you a, a water that is brown. And that water is the one that you use to mix your, your cement. So if you're using cement or you're using chukum, it's the exact same thing. The chukum, it's a beige color. And when you do a coloring cement, like a yellow cement or something different, it is not chukum. It is a color painted cement. And you can do your pool in gray cement, you can do it in yellow, you can do it in blue. You can use any color you want, uh, but it's not chukum. Chukum is a certain and a specific uh, technique and it doesn't give it any properties. It's the same as using gray cement, white cement, or any other uh, um, as cement cement finish okay another thing in the pools uh, are the lighting some people um, uh, uh, on in the past when you put a light the, it was allergen the lights have to go in a niche and this niche have to get water so the the light can get um, cooled down that was the system that cooled down the the light Nowadays, we're using LED lights, and the LED lights could be in a, in a niche, could be over-mounted on the wall. In either case, you don't have to, it doesn't matter if your pool is empty and you turn them on. If they're LED, they don't gonna burn. Before, because this mechanism of the water flowing behind uh, the allergen make the light don't, um, don't burn, if you have your pool empty, you turn it on and the, and the light will burn. It's not the case anymore. If you have an LED light and you turn it on and your pool is empty, don't worry, it's not gonna burn. Um, it works completely different. One of the other things uh, that you have to uh, consider when you have um, a leak, for example, in the pool, this is one of the most difficult things that I always get phone calls for when I get a phone call about a pool leaking it's it's a, a whole deal but the first thing i always check the first thing you want to check is the light why the light and this is how why you have a pipe going by, uh, on the pipe uh, when when you put the light the the cord the electrical cord goes inside a pipe that goes all the way to a register or to a box that is on the sidewalk of the pool and then from there it goes to an electrical connection so that connection this pipe here actually gets filled with water and that's normal but many people connect it with plastic pipes with electrical pipes or anything like that that is not prepared so at some point they broke they they break in the connections and water start leaking so if you have a leak on your pool and it's anywhere from the light up so if you have it normally this pipe comes out in the middle so if you have it from the middle of the lamp up this the light is a possibility if you have it from the light down the light is not a possibility. So in my experience, most of the time that we have a leak in a pool is the light, uh, like 90%. And then the rest of it could be uh, cracks on your pool, but those are very visible. You can see a crack very easily in a pool when it's broken. And then the other way is having um, problems on the, on the pipes. That will be the worst case scenario because all these pipes are under concrete normally. And then the other part that is very common is on the filter, um, you have a valve on top. And that valve, when you move it into waste, which is draining the pool, you move it into waste, uh, the, with the time it can fail. And if that fails, sometimes it gets um, a little leak into that drainage. And so when you're filtering 
uh, the pool, some water starts escaping that way. And there is a way to, to check that. Um, you can open the, the drain line, and when you have the filter going, the line starts spilling water, and that shouldn't be. If you have it in filter, it, the drain shouldn't be working, or water shouldn't be passing through that pipe. So that's the way to, to check it. And these are the main uh, places where you can find a leak in a pool. Okay, we're going to talk now about air conditioners. And the air conditioner, the main thing is uh, to keep them clean. Many people don't clean them. You have the filters that are normally on the front or on the top. And in the, if, if somebody calls me with a problem with air conditioner, it's almost certain it's going to be related to the maintenance. You have to do a maintenance at least once a year. And if you use the air conditioner every night, you probably have to do it every six to eight months. It's very important to keep it clean because um, if you don't clean it, you start having problems like leak, leaking of the unit. If you start leaking on, on the vents, it's one type of problem that might be related to not cleaning this. And of course, it gets, the air gets stuck in the, the dust that we have here in Merida, in every house, uh, gets felty here and you're breathing all that and you're breathing uh, all kinds of things. And then the other problem is that it starts leaking on this side of the unit. This is the unit and normally on the drain side you have some leaking going on. That leaking happens uh, when it happens just when it's raining. Well, the problem is on the roof. The unit comes down and water comes into here. If it's not when it's raining and it's just, uh, it's like constant, that might be another problem. Sometimes when they do a maintenance, they take out a pipe that goes into the wall and that pipe uh, sometimes get bended and doesn't go into the right drain. So it start draining and it drains a lot of water. And another thing that very common when they come in for this problem is that they drain it into um, a place that is not correct and it gets or it gets felty with stuff and it start getting uh, clocks in the line and that makes it back up. Another thing that have happened to us is somebody connected this actually to the to the septic and that's wrong. You want to prevent these things to be connected to the septic because when it's uh, working it's going to go with smell and in some cases, if you do a cleaning of the lines, you might end up with some stuff coming out from here. So you don't want that to happen. And talking about air conditioners, one of the main issues that I always looking like when I do inspections in houses, this is very common. The, since we don't go to the roof much, the lines of the air conditioner are normally not insulated you have to make sure they're insulated for the air conditioner to work well. Otherwise, you're passing that air through a line that is all hot and it's not properly insulated and it's not working correctly. Uh, the best thing to do is get it insulated and also many people don't do this, but you should waterproof the line. That way it will last longer and it will give you a better life of your conditioner and of course it will waste less energy.